And he looks right at me and he says, Matthew, you are a transitional character in your lineage. And that is why I do what I do. Hi there. My name is Matthew Blades, podcast host and motivational speaker. And I love keynoting and putting on workshops to help people understand the value of self-care. Because there are people in this room that feel broken, but you're not. There is nothing wrong with you. Just like there was nothing wrong with me. I just needed to step into my life's purpose more, and that's what I want to encourage you to do. Let's do this together. Head on over to learnfrompeoplewholivedit.com. I'd like you to consider for just a moment that more than half of the people who are listening to the sound of my voice will have a heart attack, stroke, or heart failure in their lifetime. However, research shows us that up to 90% of heart disease and stroke is preventable. I think about my own father who died by heart attack at just 47 years old, and I wonder how much longer he'd be around if we'd just known about Health Span MD. Dr. Todd Hurst, a board certified cardiologist, is not just my doctor. He's helped thousands of people just like you and me with his approach. Health Span MD is the way healthcare is supposed to be an ongoing partnership between you and your expert healthcare team that guides you step by step on the best opportunities to achieve your health, weight, and longevity goals. Please take a minute and sign up for his three-step consultation and witness the HealthSpan MD difference for yourself so you can be here longer for your family and most importantly, yourself. HealthSpanMD.com. HealthSpan MD, an insurance-based practice. Find and learn from people who lived it wherever you get podcasts. Search it using all one word. Learn from people who lived it. Welcome to another episode of Learn From People Who Lived It. Look at that guy on the right. I am so excited to welcome back to the podcast, Dr. Frank Bavacqua. How are you, sir? I am doing great. Good to be back. Yeah. Well, listen, you've been busy. You've been trying to take this life of yours and move it into adulthood in so many different ways, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, a little little wedding planning uh, That's that's taken up some time. Uh, I'm totally going to overestimate how much of the wedding planning I contributed to. Um, but yeah, my, uh, my fiance has done a, done a great job, but that, that has definitely taken up a lot lot of, uh, mental energy for sure. It's great to have you back, man. We are actually, uh, going to be speaking with Jill today. Um, Mm -hmm. and before we bring Jill into our conversation, Frank, I want to let you know that Jill and I, along with her daughter, Elsa, Uh, recorded an episode of Learn From People Who Lived It, I don't know, maybe 20 episodes ago. And her and her daughter were really, really a fantastic duo to bring on. And they talked about all sorts of things. And I'm not going to ruin that up front here, but just know that there's a little history here with with Jill and I. And um, Mm -hmm. so if we if we bring up something that you're unaware of, will you please stop us and ask for more context? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, then let's do it. Let's bring Jill into our Learn From People Who Lived It podcast right now. Hi, Jill. Hello. It's great to have you here. Uh, We love to start every podcast with that question, which is, what story are you here to share? So for you, what is that, Jill? I think for me, the story of loss in my life, my sister who committed suicide quite a few years ago, my mom who passed away suddenly right before COVID hit, And trying to be a single parent um, with kids that have experienced their own trauma on their own accord and function and grieve and find a way to process while doing that, um, it's tricky. And I think I did learn a few things along the way. Sounds like you're at the perfect place uh, and to give our audience an opportunity to learn from somebody who's lived it. So. The other question we'd love to ask folks, as you know, is who do you hope hears this? So as we get ready to talk today, intentionally, who do you hope is listening to this podcast? Any parent that is struggling with these same things, it might not be the identical type of loss, but I know offhand probably 10 friends that are parents that are dealing with some pretty serious adult stuff and trying to fight through also being a parent at the same time. Yeah. Well, Dr. Frank, I'm glad you're here for this episode to learn from people who lived it because uh, as you can attest to, we're all still trying to kind of figure it out, aren't we, bud? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Anybody who says they have it figured out is either lying or fooling themselves. 
Yeah, that's that's really true. Well, Jill, you mentioned on the onset that your sister completed suicide when she was 22. How old were you? Um, let's see. Actually, I was 22. She okay. was 22, 22, 25. Your mom passed away a couple of years ago. You have a father who was just diagnosed with Alzheimer's. You mm -hmm. changed careers. Um, you have a soulmate who just sustained a stroke, and now you're a caregiver. Boy, there are so many things that life is throwing your way that you've had to navigate and learn how to put one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. And so let's start at the very beginning. You know, I, I love to get that lay of the land about your upbringing, what your mom and dad were like, what your childhood was like, because that really sets the stage and the tone for how everything moves going forward. <laughs> so uh, briefly, give uh, us a little bit of the lay of the land. What was it growing? What was it like growing up with your parents, your siblings, your situation? Have you ever seen the movie War of the Roses? It's a divorce film and it's a very nasty divorce. And of course they tweak it with humor, but that was kind of my upbringing. And my mom was, you know, your quintessential fifties woman. She dropped out of college to get married and have kids. And suddenly now she's a single mom of three children. Um, she dealt with that by diving into religion. I guess we could be grateful that it wasn't drugs or alcohol, but she dove pretty deep and moved us to East Texas from San Jose, California, uh, to attend a church from some preacher man that she saw in some tent revival thing. So we moved around a lot growing up. Um, I was never in the same school longer than two years at a time. I wasn't in the same state longer than five years at a time. So stability wasn't really in any of our vocabulary until I think I had my own children and have now been here since 2004, really because of that, because I didn't want to move or do that to them. So it was pretty chaotic. Yeah. <laughs> and um, people joke that you need a passport to go down to Texas or deep south, and they're not wrong. It's an entirely different way of being. Well, and I'll be honest with you, the way that I hear you sort of describe that situation immediately, and I don't know why I went there, but immediately I thought of like some religious kind of, I don't want to use the word cult because I hate that word, but some religious group of people, and I can see it in your face, like maybe it was, right? Like maybe it was some, some sort of a religious group where they had kind of committed to their own set of rules and ways of doing things. And boy, if you were in the club, you were in the club. And if you weren't, then get the hell out of there. But is that kind of how you, you viewed it growing up? Um, definitely. And yeah. I think from birth, I've always been just a little left of in the group whatever group it was, um, whether it was regular school or, you know, I moved from East Texas back here to Arizona to start my freshman year of high school at Central High. So I was like one of like 500 freshmen, you know, with my Southern accent and dressing like I did back in Marshall, <laughs> you know, and again, just a little left of fitting in. Um, now as a grown up. I, I flourish in that and I, I fight those groups to expand those lines so that they aren't so rigid. But when you're younger, it's definitely hard. Dr. Frank, I want to bring you in uh, right away, as I usually like to do, which is uh, to ask you a question about how, the impacts of an upbringing like that. And so mm -hmm. uh, I'm not here to ask you about, you know, what religion might do to somebody, but I am here to ask <laughs> you what stability might do to somebody later in life. If you're a kid who grows up and listen, people move like I moved. I was in a military mm -hmm. family and, you know, we, we I started junior high at a new school. I started high school at a new school. And so that happens. People move all the time and that's part yeah. of life. But when you're moving around so much that you're using words later in life, like it was unstable. There was no stability. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are the long term implications of that for somebody? How's yeah, that going to impact them later in life? There's. Stability doesn't necessarily mean staying in one place, right? Like, and you kind of described it, right? We moved, we switched schools, we moved houses. You can even move states. Uh, stability, a lot of times, just means like, is there is there a home base? Um, you know, can I count on my parents to one always be there? Two. Um, you know, we've heard it before where people have said, like, I never knew which version of my mom or dad I was going to get that day or that week. Um, 
So it's not just about geographically moving. It's is there is there consistency? Um, is there emotional consistency? In this case, if if mom is kind of making this decision, you know, jumping into this new thing and and it sounds like kind of uprooting and and chasing this thing, you know, it's not that that's bad, but for a little kid who maybe doesn't understand why some of these decisions are being made, it it doesn't feel stable, right? And and when you grow up in that, it's very hard for you. Sometimes it can be hard for people to trust. It can be hard for people to create their own version of stability later on. Um, and I've said it before plenty of times that we either we grow up in something and we either replicate it or we kind of um, denounce it and try to do the exact opposite. And Jill, and it sounds like you tried to do the exact opposite, right? I moved around so much, there was instability. So I'm going to establish roots and I'm going to make sure that my kids don't move around, you know, a, a ton of times. Uh, and so you're, you're kind of the example of, I didn't like this thing that I grew up in and I'm going to do my best to create kind of the exact opposite, right? And not kind of continue that pattern. Does to that speak point? to you, Jill? Yeah, I mean, to a point. Um, okay. I started out that way. You know, like I'm going... Mm -hmm when you come from a family with multiple siblings, everybody kind of has their title, you know, what, what they are. My brother was the smart one. He scored like a perfect score on his ECTs. My sister was bipolar. So she was the crazy one, but also the pretty one. And then there was me. <laughs> I had the blonde hair. I was odd man out in my own family. Everyone else is brunette. Um, you know, and so I wanted to make my name, by being the one that does what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to go get the good job. You're supposed to graduate college. You're supposed to buy a house. You're supposed to get married and have the kids. And I did those things and looked at these milestones. Like if I do this next one, then I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. And so then I did it and I'm like, okay, well now I need to do this. Then I'll be happy. And it was around when Elsa was about seven I realized this is ridiculous. I am enduring my life every day for the sake of some greater good. There's no greater good being served here. She was picking up on the tension and the unhappiness. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'm going to die of a heart attack by the time I'm 30. This is insane. Why am I doing this? I would rather teach my children. It's okay to break from those molds and do what you need to do to be happy and try to show them a better way through that mess. And yeah, I hated to repeat a divorce because I always swore like, I'm never going to do that to my kids. And I yeah. did it to my kids, but I gave it everything I had to try to do it better. I don't know if it necessarily worked out that way, but I tried. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to you yeah, go ahead. I was going to say two two things that you said there that I think um, can easily resonate with a lot of people. And one is doing all the things that you think you're supposed to do because other people expect them of you. Or you're, it, sometimes we're trying to gain somebody's approval. Sometimes we've just been, you know, taught. I, I think back to when I was growing up, I've, I feel like going to college was the only opportunity or the only option kind of presented to me. That's what my my parents kind of mm -hmm. expected of me. And and I personally don't regret that decision. I think it worked out okay for me, but there are some people who are only presented with one option and they follow it, even though it's not necessarily what would have worked out best for them. Right. So I think we can all kind of relate to um, being expected to do something and, and feeling like if we do that thing, maybe something good will happen. The other thing I think four of the most dangerous words that we can say in order are I'll be happy when mm -hmm. and, and fill that in with whatever. Um, mm. Yes. Situations can improve. Give, you know, my situation can improve if I get a raise or if I get a new job that I might be happier with. Um, you know, if, if I'm single and I'm hoping to find a partner, I, I, I there might be some beneficial things that happen at the other end of that, but to say I'll be happy when, and to put that stock in that, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes I think we get disappointed that when we reach that milestone, this, this flood of happiness 
doesn't just overwhelm us. And if it does, it's, it's fleeting, right? It doesn't last a week or a month. It'll last a day. Um, but it sounds like you figured that out. Well, I figured, and not alone, by the way, I want to add, I Mm. went through extensive therapy, (laughs) Mm. um, because I realized in saying I'll be happy when why I was doing that is if you look at the reverse situation, that means I'm not happy now. Mm-hmm. And that's uncomfortable. And mm-hmm. it's not a pleasant feeling. And I think we as humans try to avoid feeling bad. Yeah. And I kind of got stuck in anger mode, where that was really the only emotion I could identify with that I could express easily. Um, I had this irrational fear of crying in front of my kids. Like to me, crying was like throwing up. You do it behind a closed door when no one's looking. It's a private matter. I don't know why. Um, I think, again, goes back to the way I was brought up. Just keep smiling and everything will be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's hard to recognize, like, I'm not happy right now. Yeah. And to be okay with those feelings that that brings. Yeah. I remember driving home from work one day, and I talk about this when I do my speaking engagements now, and this feeling came over me that was, I will never be happy again. And what was dangerous about that thought, for me at least, was I became okay with it. I kind of settled in with that idea that, all right, this is where I'm at in my life. I've got kids and a house and a mortgage and cars and you know, 529 plans to fund and all this stuff that Frank has to look forward to here now that he's getting, uh, you know, himself hitched up here in a couple of months and kids and all that. But you know what, that, that, that's a space that I think a lot of parents can find themselves in, um, especially if they grow up in a place in a, in a, or in a home rather where they're always trying to be the good kid, the kid that gets it right. The kid that doesn't rock the boat, you know, because, you sort of when you when you grow up that way, at least my experience tells me that you're not really ever asking yourself what you need. You're always kind of doing things for other people. And then oftentimes it's not until later in life where you're faced with some big you know, catastrophe or tragedy or something like that. Do you start to discover who you are? And so, OK, let's let's move this conversation, Jill, into a place where you eventually then you get married and then, as you just told us, you ended up getting a divorce. Were there repeating patterns in your marriage that were similar to that of your mom and dad's? Or was it a totally different situation? And then what led you to the moment where you said, because it had to have been painful. You told us it was. I, I have to end this relationship. So I know I asked a lot of questions there. So what was <laughs> happening? Was it similar to what you saw growing up? And how did you come to that decision that this was what you needed to do? Well, I think first I should clarify, I I was not the quote unquote good kid. I actually was expelled from Central my sophomore year. Like I went off the rails, rightfully so, considering what all was happening. Um, But that that's what ended up driving me to hit these milestones was that fear of if I don't work as hard as I possibly can every day, I'm going to end up back there. I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to be depressed or whatever. It was, it wasn't a rational fear, um, but it drove me. And I got married to somebody who was the opposite of my dad who really reached the pinnacle of his career as high as you can get as a civil engineer. He's worked on projects all over the world. He used to travel to Dubai and Europe and did all these amazing, fabulous things. And then there was me with my English degree. (laughs) Um, He never let me forget about that one. Um, But at least now I can say I out-degree him because I have a master's. And, you know, I believed my ex-husband, when we got together that, you know, he had all these dreams. I had all these dreams and I had every intention of seeing those dreams come true. I knew that about myself with enough tenacity and persistence, I could make these things happen. And I assumed he was the same way. And then I learned, oh, he's not that way. And it dawned on me 17 years into our marriage, why are we beating each other up. And I envision like a blacksmith, like pounding away at this thing. 
trying to turn each other into who we want the other person to be when we could stop that and go find the people we actually want. <laughs> that seems far less painful and less destructive. And, you know, it was never, it was never like one moment. I think it was a lot of moments that kept repeating, you know, the same fights, the same cycles you get stuck in, in a marriage. And I was working two jobs at the time. It was during the economy collapse. We lost our house and he picked a fight with me at 10 o'clock at night as I finally closed the laptop on my night job. And I just went, I'm done. <laughs> and then I threw up and had a migraine so bad we had to call an ambulance because I think that release of tension and emotion and that thing you feared the most, I finally spoke out loud, which starts that those wheels spinning. You can't come back from that. You can't go, oh, I was kidding, never mind. Um, so it was terrifying, but exciting at the same time. If a little bit of, questions. yeah, probably a little bit of freedom, right? To, to, to finally set that down. And like you said, stop beating it like a blacksmith, stop trying to make everything so and just accept what is so. Mm -hmm. I remember I called my grandma, who I was terrified to tell her. She very Baptist. Um, she was probably in her 80s at the time. And she goes, Well, you know what, hon? There's just only so much a woman couldn't put up with. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that meant the world to me. I was like, oh, this is going to be okay. Like I can tell people and everyone's not going to, you know, disapprove. Some people did, but it at least opened that door to the possibility that we can get through this. Um, and it wasn't easy for sure. It still isn't easy. There's still challenges with it, but it's still better than it would have been had we stayed together. Frank, I want to ask you a question about divorce yeah. specifically because I know that you've you've probably dealt with this a hundred times in your career. But th there's that idea that like I can't get a divorce because what what am I showing my my kids? But then there's mm -hmm. the flip side of that coin, which is I should get a divorce and show my kids. Mm -hmm. And so, how can other people kind of start to land on B, which is like. Like she said, there's no use in sitting here and trying to beat this thing and trying to shape it into what I want it to be. Let me set this down and try something new. But how can folks make that that happen in their head and their hearts and their minds so that they can actually, you know, do it? What do you advise? Well, yeah, if it were easy, here. more <laughs> if it were easy, more people would probably do it, right? And it's it's not. And I think I think a big reason why it's not easy, and and Jill kind of mentioned it, and Matthew, I was going to bring it up to you a second ago. Like, how many times have we talked to people who had some kind of secret that they didn't want to tell people, they didn't want people to find out about, or like a, a decision? You know, they they had thoughts of wanting to make a decision. Um, moving, getting a divorce, whatever. Uh, and they were afraid to tell the people in their life because they were afraid of what the reaction was going to be. Um, and it's, it's certainly not a perfect success record, but it seems like more times than not. And Jill, you were lucky enough to kind of experience that with your grandma. It sounds like, um, the, the people that we ultimately end up telling are more accepting and more on our side, uh, than we think they're going to be. And usually that's because that decision was being made for you. It's not, it doesn't sound like from what you've described that you were in some kind of a, a situation that, you know, was, was hard, but something that a, a married couple should work through and stick. You, were, you weren't running away from mm -hmm. something that was hard. You were potentially opening yourself up to run towards something better. And people that genuinely care about you and love you should be on board and, and on on, on your side with that. Um, and maybe that, maybe I, I started to give myself the answer to the question that I didn't know. I mean, start to ask yourself, you know, are you running away from something that is hard? Um, you know, are you dropping out of college before you finish the degree because it's, it's hard and it's challenging 
Or did you genuinely decide that this is not the path that you want to pursue? So why waste two more years of your life intuition? Um, because there's something else that you actually care about a whole lot more. Um, maybe, maybe that's, that's part of it, right? Cause we don't want to set the example for our kids that we're a quitter, right? That that's not, that's not something that I think people would look favorably upon. Um, but we are allowed to change course and change direction and decide that we want something more or different or better than what we currently have. Don't you feel like that's what you've shown your own kids, Jill? I hope. Um, as you were speaking, a vivid memory of my daughter right after the divorce and we had sold the house and now living separately. And she's just bawling her eyes out to me and says, you said when you guys got divorced, you'd be happy, but you're not happy and everything's worse. Hmm. And she was 10 thinking, okay, how do I explain to this 10 year old in this moment? No, I'm not happy, but deeper inside. I am happy. Like there was levels to being a grown up that she was never going to understand. She gets it now. Um, I hope that I've shown them it's okay to do what's hard and to kind of take that leap. Um, I've always been the type of parent where I, I try to demystify mom. I am not all knowing. I am not all seeing. I don't have the answers. Today is the first day of my life. I've ever raised a kid your exact age to both of them. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. So work with me here. Let's do it together and communicate and I'll make mistakes and I'll own up to them. You'll make mistakes and you better own up to them. And it's a different style of parenting. (laughs) (laughs) I recognize that, but for us, like it's worked, Um, you know, especially with Elsa, with my son, who's an entirely different individual. He's a little trickier, but um I didn't want to ever give them this false idea that I somehow have all the answers because then I think throughout your life, you're looking for who can give me the answers when they have to come from you. I can't tell them what to do with their lives. I can guide them. I can give advice, but ultimately they have to learn to listen to their own inner voices. And what happens if one day, and it will happen when I'm not here, are they going to be lost and not know how to function or live their lives because I've made them so dependent on me and I didn't want that for them. Yeah. I'm actually, I mean, I'm a huge fan of that style that you described, right? It's not about just giving the answers, but it's almost about enlightening others. In this case, your kids like into how, you made the decisions, right? And so ultimately teaching them how to kind of make those decisions too. Um, Cause uh, life, there is virtually nothing about life that is a straight line, right? Yeah. Like it's not yeah. do this thing, become happier, do this thing, become wealthier. Like it is, it is virtually never a straight line and grief is a weird thing. A lot of times we only think of grief when we're talking about somebody who died, passed mm-hmm. away, but like, you can still mourn the loss of a marriage, right? Odds are not everything about that marriage was terrible. There were probably positive things about that person and that relationship, things that you in the, in the short term missed, um, Mm -hmm. which probably kind of leads to the sadness in that moment. Ultimately, I think you knew that the positive in the long run was going to outweigh, you know, the, the negative in the short run. Um, but teaching that to somebody who's 10 is, I mean, it's, it's hard to teach that to somebody who's 40 or 50, but to teach somebody, do you remember what your actual answer to her was at that when she asked you, like, you said you were going to be, you were going to be happier when, uh, <laughs> and it's when, and you're not happy. Do you remember what you said? Cause that is not I an know. easy question. I think I told her that. I wasn't happy in that moment because she was upset and her brother who was five at the time, like it was just one of those nights where nobody's doing what they should be doing (laughs) and everything is wrong. Um, You know, and I kind of laid that out for her. Here's all the things that have led up to me feeling the way that I'm feeling in this exact moment that you're Mm -hmm. responding to. 
and that I too am sad Hmm. that she misses her dad. And the way, oof, got like a lump in my throat thinking about that because I I felt a lot of guilt because I was the one that raised the white flag and I felt I'm directly responsible for the way that she's standing here feeling right now. And I know what that felt like because my parents did it and it was complicated, Um, you know, and tried to tell her like, we feel this way right in this moment. But do you remember yesterday when we went bike riding and how much fun we had and we were happy and that's just the way it's going to be. We're going to have good times and we're going to have not so good times. And I apologized for me being grumpy or however I was that was impacting her and then try to say, let's, let's do something, you know, throw out the rule book. You don't have to be, everybody doesn't have to be in bed by eight. Let's watch a movie, you know, let's get all, everyone in my bed and let's turn on the TV and let's just do something that I know when we were married wouldn't have ha- happened. And so, that's, that's um, great advice. And, and I encourage everybody to go back and listen to the episode that we recorded with Jill and Elsa, because it was just uh, unbelievable in so many different ways. But one of the things that's going to strike everybody is the unbelievable close relationship that you have with Elsa. So while you guys have certainly, you know, gone through your troubled waters and had your moments, clearly, clearly things are better on the other side. You are closer. You are more articulate with each other. You are able to communicate in ways that most moms and daughters like go to war over, right? (laughs) Like there's all of this stuff has lent itself to you developing a much closer relationship with your daughter. And if, if anybody goes and listens to that episode, you're going to feel that you're going to sense that. And you do get a sense for, the fact that you, Jill, were honest enough to say, I don't have all the answers. I'm figuring this out, too. If she comes to you and she says, I'm missing him, it's you strike me to be the kind of person who might be so honest and say, listen, I miss pieces, too. But ultimately, we're going to be better on the other side of this. Mm-hmm. And um, that's that's such a thing. And Frank, I want to ask you as a psychologist, from your point of view, I, and I don't know this, but I feel like a lot of parents get stuck in schedule, in routine, and this is the way it's supposed to be. But there is a time, as Jill said, to throw out that playbook and do something different, right? I I personally love routine. I, it's like it's just it's my favorite thing. It's it's my <laughs> happy. I like I like knowing what to expect and when to expect it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's a comfortable place. And in general, you know, the more structure and routine that you provide to kids early on, like that's typically a good thing, right? But you obviously don't want to go so rigid as to not allow to step outside of that box. And as you were saying, so, uh, I, I, I don't have kids yet. I'm getting married in a month. We, we hope that kids are in the near future. So we'll like, we'll see how life plays out. Um, but I'm, I'm sitting because everything that we've talked about so far has been, you know, we're going to establish routines and we're going to have rules and we're going to say no. And right. We have all these grand ideas and obviously the playbook gets tossed out the window as soon as, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but I like, I almost love that like intentional, like, once a week or once a month, like we kind of break the rule, right? We break the structure, right? It's, uh, it's, you know, your bedtime is supposed to be eight o'clock on a school night, like one time, one time this month, we're just going to kind of throw that out the window and, and let's do, because then you can kind of learn like one, you can learn it's okay to step outside. Right. And mm-hmm. two, um, I, I think it, it just, it breaks the rigidity of like, I have to do this either because yeah. I say so or somebody else says so. Uh, so I, I heard that and I was like, I'm a, I'm a file that away in the mental Rolodex. Cause I, I like, but like making it like an intentional thing, like we're, we're going to kind of like together as a family, like break, break this rule one time. Well, I mean, we as adults even, uh, even the doctors learning from people who lived it. I love it. <laughs> I mean, I think what I tell friends who are going through a divorce is, and they're crying or upset or worried, you know, 
I was only able to like intentionally do fun things because I suddenly had time to be me again. Um, I actually got my shoulder tattoo the day my divorce was finalized and it's a Triskelion to remind me and I wanted it front center. So I saw it every day of balance, mind, body, soul, and there's semicolons around it for my sister. Um, and it really has acted as a reminder to help me to do, take time to do something I want to do, to explore something I want to explore that has nothing to do with anybody else, children, nobody. And because I did that, I was far more grounded and stable of a person to be there for them. Um, I remember the first vacation I wanted to take them to Disneyland. My daughter had been before, but she was three. She didn't remember. My son never been. And I think he was six at the time. And I was terrified. And everyone's like, why? I said, you don't know my son. <laughs> he, he could bolt at any moment. And I'm going to be alone. And I'm imagining all these scenarios in my head. Like, what if we're stuck in the middle of a line and one of them needs to go to the bathroom? I'm only one adult. What am I going to do? And there's even pictures on my Facebook where I'm in tears at the fireworks show the last night we were there because it was an amazing trip. Elsa stepped up. She filled that role of I'll go stand in line. You go catch William. And he even was on like his absolute best behavior. There was no fights. There was no crying. There was no screaming. And I think that trip for me was transformative in realizing I can do this alone. I'm, I'm capable. I am the things I was told growing up, you know, especially in high school when I had a rough go of things, they are not true. Like I, I am capable and I, I can do this and I can be what I want to be for them and show them like, it's okay. If you are alone, that's not a bad thing. It's not a sad thing. We still had fun and they still talk about that trip. You mentioned a moment ago, the semicolon that's on your shoulder. And you, you said that it uh, represents your sister who you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier on uh, struggled with some bipolar, uh, um, uh, the bipolar disorder. And so I want to ask you maybe now that it's, it's been a few years since she's passed, Mm -hmm. what, if anything, did you learn from that experience? Oh, gosh, so much. Um, I think the most important thing I learned was, you know, after the funeral, we go back to their house and her husband says, you know, you can go up to a room, pick out, you know, some things that you want to take. And I'm standing there and she was a close horse. I mean, so many clothes and shoes and jewelry. And I'm thinking, is this seriously, this is it. And to be so young with that realization, like when we go, literally that's all that is left of us is our stuff. And it, I liken it to a deck of cards, kind of just like 52 pickup being thrown onto the floor. My order of life was disrupted in realizing it doesn't matter what clothes I have or what jewelry or a comp, like none of it matters. Cause when I go, it's just going to be someone else going through my stuff, deciding what they want to keep. And so I need to do the things in my life that mean something to me because that's all that really matters. I need to, to do what I can that has meaning and to make bigger impacts than how many pairs of shoes can I leave behind for my children to go through. I want to have more of a legacy to my life than that. That's my legacy is raising two children who are going to be decent humans on this planet and look out for other people. What strikes me, and I wonder if it strikes you too, Dr. Frank, is uh, that at every turn, the one thing that Jill has going for her, she doesn't seem to stop moving. She keeps going, right? She keeps putting one foot in front of the other. And isn't that the ultimate lesson for all of us who experience hardship along the way? Because we all do, right? But those of us who stop moving get real stuck. 
And that's the thing that strikes me about her. And so, Dr. Frank, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to speak on that a little bit. It's so challenging to keep moving because you can, I mean, you even said it just a second ago, right, Jill? It's like, I, I would get mad at the world for keep, for the way that it kept moving while I was in pain. But yet if we, if we don't keep moving, then we stay stuck. And so speak to the importance of putting one foot in front of the other, even if it's just your pinky toe. <laughs> there's, there's a couple pieces here that I think it can be easy for people to kind of misinterpret. And, you know, Jill, as you were saying, like, you know, being mad at the world for, you know, the sun continuing to rise and the world continuing to spin and that kind of thing. Like the, the image that I had kind of, kind of conjured up in my head in that moment was like sitting at, on an overpass watching like all the cars drive by, like they're all going somewhere, right? They have something going on with their day and I'm just kind of stuck here, not moving. Ooh. And I don't want, I don't want, people to think that like the lack of physical movement or the lack of doing something is being stuck. Because I think when it comes to grief of any kind, sitting in it is actually progress, ignoring it, distracting yourself from it. Um, good sometimes in small doses, but in general, like sometimes you have to sit in sit in it to kind of work through it, and that is progress. So it doesn't look like outward movement per se, um, but it is progress. Uh, the other image that kind of comes to mind, I'm not a, a huge hiker, but I, I understand sort of the concept that when you're climbing a mountain, it's not literally a straight line to the top, right? Sometimes you got to turn left, sometimes you got to turn right. Sometimes you even end up technically like going down before you like turn the corner and start going back up again. Um, and all of those movements are still progress. And so sometimes it will feel like you're turning left or turning right or actually going uh, back down, right? That whole one step forward, two steps back thing. Um, all of that counts. The, the one thing in all of that that you can't do is stay literally still and stuck and distract yourself from what's happening, like lie to yourself about what, what the reality of the situation is. As long as you're kind of like mentally working through something or physically moving, then, then that's, then that's something. Mm, I would say your analogy made me think, and sometimes when you're hiking, you get stuck and have to call for help. <laughs> um, yeah. I've done that multiple times throughout my mm. life. Um, about two months after my sister died, I realized like, I'm not, moving through this emotionally. I was going to work. I was functioning, mm -hmm. but I recognized kind of this precipice <laughs> that I don't want to go over, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not, this isn't getting better. Yeah. It seems to be getting worse. And mm -hmm. I, you know, got help with for just a few months just to kind of get through that. Cause I didn't know how or yeah. what to do really to get through it. Yeah. Uh, today must just be analogy day in my head. I, I mean, I normally love them, but I feel like I love them a lot today. Um, <laughs> uh, so like, I, I mean, I play a lot of softball and sometimes like you get hit with a ball and it gets, you know, and it bruises up and, uh, I'm, I think sort of your stereotypical male of like, if a bone's not sticking out, like if I'm not bleeding, like it's probably fine. Like it might hurt, you know, and if I push on it today, it'll hurt. But in a week, if I push on it, it should hurt a little bit less. And in, in a month, if I push on that same spot again, it should hurt less, right? Uh, and I, you know, that, that whole idea of precipice, right? Every, every time I let myself get close to that emotional point, if it feels just as intense, you know, six months from now as it did six months ago, then there's something that's not healing there, right? It mm -hmm. shouldn't hurt the same exact amount when you press on it six months down the road. Um, yeah. The, and that, that's sort of your indication that like, you're not, you're not going through it. You keep backing mm -hmm. away from it. Right. And so calling for help in that moment, you know, Hey, I need somebody to take me by the hand and, and bring me through the, to the other side of it. I think that's a, that's a really smart it's thing to do. And I wish more people did. To yeah. experience something so powerful that you feel it's, it's literally going to break you. Mm-hmm. It is a very frightening moment. And I feel for people who don't know 
that that's a common human thing. You're not alone. There's nothing wrong with you. And there are people available to help you. And it doesn't mean your life's over or that you are going to go crazy or lose your brain or whatever. It's, it's a feeling and like feeling happy. It'll pass. Yeah. But there will be another day. Um, You know, now all these years later and losing my mom suddenly, and we were super close and I was there when she died and I had a, almost a little PTSD about that. And then my partner having the stroke and kind of all happening around the same time frame. And there was a good period of time where it was difficult to get out of bed. And my kids would come in and I, at least now I knew the, the words and the language to say, I am feeling very depressed right now. I'm feeling overwhelmed and I'm sad and I need, I need to just kind of be this way right now, you know, and talk them through like, it's okay to sit with this. And that's, I recognized I needed to do that. If I tried to distract myself or let's go on a family vacation and, you know, everybody stop crying. Let's go. Like that wasn't going to help anybody, but you know, I like to think that showing them kind of that roller coaster ride of ups and downs and how you can get through it. I hope it was valuable for them and then they can use it later in life. Well, and it's, I mean, it's so counterintuitive, right? We're, we're usually taught to like avoid pain physical Mm -hmm. or emotional, right? If it's, if it's hot and it burns, we don't touch it again. Uh, If we touch it and it pokes us, we don't do it again. Um, and I think sometimes we try to do that emotionally too, because it's it's just mm-hmm. it's habit, right? This doesn't feel good, and I want to avoid it or run away from it or whatever. Uh, and it's counterintuitive to know that, like, in order to eventually feel better, you do actually have to sit in it. Because if you only ignore it, and it's something that sometimes there's little things that we should ignore, right? And we wake up tomorrow and it's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but but if there's if there's something there that deserves attention, no amount of distraction will ever make it go away until mm-hmm. you figure out how to kind of get through to the other end. Um, which is why I'm glad that you're somebody who's willing to or was willing is willing to ask for help to kind of get pulled through. Sometimes we just need to be like pulled through, right? Mm-hmm. And, and to recognize the other side isn't as scary as we think it is. Oh yeah. Now I call friends and anybody that'll listen to me. Like (laughs) there it is. And, and, and as we kind of wind down the podcast, I, 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 it would be beneficial for us to discuss this idea of tools. And, you know, we, we talk about being healed, healing up all of these things like broken bones heal up, right? The, the death of your sister, the death of your mom, the divorce from your husband, they like, those are wounds. They don't ever heal. You just learn how to live with them. You learn how Mm -hmm. to deal with them. You reach into your toolbox And so you've mentioned a couple of tools that I want to really make sure we highlight really quick. Number one was I ask for help. Okay. So anybody and everybody listening, that's one of them. Ask for help. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be afraid. Reach out. Promise you people want to help. I I think I was, I I remember what sort of class I was in, but the guy that was talking said that the, the, the most powerful words in the English language are, can you help me? Because people just want to, they're, they're innate nature is to want to be there for each other. And then the other thing, the other tool that you mentioned is I feel, I feel my emotions and I don't try to shy away from them. I feel my emotions. And so Jill, what other tools are you using to keep putting one foot in front of the other? And Dr. Frank, I'm going to ask you the same question in, in, in a moment after she answers, what are tools that people can use so that they can put one foot in front of the other? Jill, you're up first though. Oh gosh. Um, not only do I feel my emotions, I talk them because I want people around me to know this is exactly what I'm feeling so that they're not making assumptions and then acting based off of those assumptions. And I want to be really clear. Um, and then there's things for myself. Um, I started crocheting again. I haven't crocheted in God knows how many years. I'm not very good at it. But there are organizations in the Valley that want donations of handmade blankets. I thought, well, thank God, because otherwise this house is going to look like it's owned by a 105-year-old woman with, like, 
<laughs> toilet paper holders, crochet. Like, what are you going to do with all of it, right? Like, I've got to. Thanks for my doily. Yeah. Somebody's got to <laughs> take this stuff. Um, but it's weird. My Fitbit even showed me that the act of crocheting lowered my heart rate and my blood pressure. So it's, you know, feeling them and it's not actively trying to distract myself from it, but doing things that are going to be healthy for me to lower my heart rate, lower my blood pressure, doing the supernatural workout thing on the Oculus with my son. You know, it's, it's finding whatever joy I can in that day. And if it's not even in that day, it's find something that just doesn't suck super bad in that moment, you know, and just know the sun will rise the next day and you'll get through it. You got through today. Okay, Frank, your turn. Tools to help us put one foot in front of the other. Um, I'm going to kind of piggyback a little bit. I, I think we all have, hopefully have, one or more just activities that we, that we love that kind of make us feel alive. Um, sports has always kind of been that for me. Um, for some people it is just, you know, kind of like hiking, like we talked about. Sometimes it's, it's arts and crafts, which I zero (laughs) skill, um, you know, but they're like, there's, there's something that we all have that, that is enjoyable. And I think sometimes when we're, when we're stuck in, in crap, um, sometimes we don't think that we deserve to do something enjoyable. (laughs) Sometimes it's hard to get ourselves out and to go do it. I think it's important to do it because it provides a basis of comparison and it reminds you that, that the crap that you're stuck in feeling isn't normal. It's not, it's not supposed to feel like that all the time. Um, so giving yourself opportunities to feel different, feel better, even if it's fleeting. Um, I think that's a way that, that we can kind of see like, cause then when you go back home and that thing is over or whatever, and then you're back to feeling that way, like that, that basis of comparison shows you that, oh, I can feel that way more. What do I, and, and maybe you start to question, what do I need to do to get out of this and into that more? Um, but I think a lot of times we just don't give ourselves permission to go do something fun or to do something different because we're feeling bad or sad or guilty or whatever. Uh, and so we don't do it at all. Or the first time we try it, it's not fun because we are still feeling bad, sad, guilty, whatever. Um, so do it again, right? And do it a third time and do it a fourth time. Um, and it may not be the world's best blanket, but somebody's going to love that blanket someday, uh, <laughs> right? And so you just keep doing it and get a little better and it's a little more fun. And it keeps providing that basis of comparison of this is how I can feel. Okay, how do I, what do I have to do to get here more often? We have, between the three of us, I hope, given the folks who are listening to our podcast right now, a handful of tools, at least five tools that you could put into your toolbox right now to help you put one foot in front of the other and keep on moving because everybody's going to come up with hard stuff. We're all going to open up the oh shit door at some point in our lives and see what comes through. And the, the, the better we are, the more equipped we are with tools and strategies the better off we will be in the long run. And so I, I want to go back and kind of close with this thought, Jill, of with, with all of the things that have been handed to you along the way. Is there a theme? Is there something that you have ultimately landed on and learned from your experiences? Whoa, that's a heavy question. Um and I'm giggling to myself because this, it just randomly popped in my head and my mom would be so disappointed in me, but a clean kitchen isn't going to solve any problems. Mm. <laughs> and Yes. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's I, my I honest have... gut response. Now tonight at 2 a.m., I'll probably wake up and go, oh, I should have <laughs> said, but that is what popped into my head. <laughs> Why do you like that so much, Frank? <laughs> I just, I just have a person or two or three that I wish she could <laughs> share. That. Um, no, but it, it, like, it's, it's such a, like the, I think back to like college finals week, right? Like mm-hmm. the joke was always like, you know, nobody's, nobody's dorm 
was as clean as it was during finals week. And it's like, because everybody, they felt guilty if they weren't productive at all, but they didn't want to study. So they cleaned instead. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's like, sometimes I think we just, we, we put too much emphasis or care about the wrong things or fixing the wrong things. Like I'm probably more affected when things aren't going well for me in life. I'm more affected by whether my, my favorite team won or lost that day. Right. That's kind of what I throw myself into. Um, And it's like, I put more caring into something outside of it because I don't want to look at whatever's not comfortable right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, cleaning is an easy one. It's, it's a distraction. Um, Right. And we, we put so much effort into those kind of things. And and sometimes that's just, that's not where our effort needs to be. And I hate cleaning. Let it go for a night. (laughs) You want to die because there's dishes in the sink. Right. Save your sanity. Like Mm -hmm. it's okay. Yeah. It is okay. I promise. Right. Yeah. I just Good love that sentiment. It's not going to come knocking at your door. <laughs> it's just such a beautiful sentiment. When I'll tell you what I heard when you said that, Joe, was be okay with a mess. Mm-hmm. Be, be okay that it isn't always beautiful and perfect all the time. When I speak to groups now, I say, your job now is to learn to live with the sound of your record. And what that means is like sometimes you got to be okay when the wave is really high, but you also got to be okay with it when there's no wave at all and it's still and there's nothing happening at all. And I just love, 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 love the idea of a, that your, your clean kitchen analogy. It's just so perfect. It says to everybody, let it be messy for a little while. It will be okay. You too will come out of that. Mm-hmm. They'll get done. Dishes will mm-hmm. be done. Floors will be mopped. Mm-hmm. I know we've only explored a few chapters in your life, Jill, but I, I really know that a lot of folks have come away from this conversation just feeling like, number one, they're not alone. They, too, have been you know through their own set of circumstances and hearing your situation and the way that you kept putting one foot in front of the other is so helpful to them. Dr. Frank, as we come to a close, is there anything that stands out from today's conversation that you want to drive home with folks? I think, I think Jill is the latest example. Like in Matthew, we've talked about this before the, the people who come and, and our guests here and, and share their story. They're not at some magical finish line, right? They're not, they're not done. Um, but they are on the other side of some major hump or humps in their life. And I think Jill is the latest example of somebody who is on the other side of, of some of the, the challenges in her life and exhibits really healthy habits, right? There are things that she does and she does well emotionally, ways that she handles things um, and you know all those tools, right? Like I don't think... And it wouldn't even make sense to have somebody on here who presumably was on the other side of some major challenge and who hadn't figured out like good, healthy ways to do things. Um, and usually we figure out some of those ways in the beginning and they start us in the right direction. And then we figure out some more as we go along. But uh, yeah, healthy, healthy habits is the, uh, the, and not, you know, it's not about eating right and exercising, but like um, healthy emotional habits, being honest about your feelings, talking out your feelings, writing out your feelings, sharing with others, kind of, you know, being transparent with how you're feeling. All of those things are are common elements that I think we've heard from from everybody. And Jill is the the latest, greatest example of that. Jill, I'll give you the final word. As we got ready to talk today, there must have been something on your mind. You thought, well, I hope that I say this. I hope that I convey this. Is there anything that we haven't put on the table that you feel as though would be important to to announce? I don't think so. Um, Just with the most recent challenges, the only final thought I have is just be kind. You know, look look for ways to be kind to other people, no matter what, whether you're a cashier or a customer or a doctor, it doesn't find one way to just be a positive influence on someone else's existence in their little world and their skin for that moment, rather than maybe take the easy way and be selfish and be mean, just be kind. 
because you don't know what other people are dealing with. The Dalai Lama says it best, right? Our goal in this world is to help other people. And if you can't help them at a very minimum, don't hurt them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really just such a truth in this conversation. Thank you, Jill, so much for sharing. Uh, I really appreciate your, your openness and uh, letting us know a little bit about your world and then how you're navigating through it. And Dr. Frank, thank you so much for your time today too, sir. Always. All right. Thanks everybody for listening to this episode of learn from people who lived it. Follow us along online, learn from people who lived it.com. And if you too would like to be a guest on our show, I hope that you'll uh, hit that form there at learn from people who lived it.com just like Jill did. And you'll be able to jump on and share your story with us. Thanks again, guys. We have three goals with learn from people who lived it. One to help you feel less alone. Two, Encourage you to seek out a coach, a therapist, a church, anyone who can help you get through your journey and find some healing. Three, when you're ready, share your story with us. Find Learn From People Who Lived It wherever you get podcasts. Search it using all one word, Learn From People Who Lived It.